<clears throat> okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Medicine Buddha Practice. Welcome to those of you who are new. It's so good to, to be in this space with you all uh, right now. Um, and feel free to say hello um, in the chat box as well. And I see that we have some announcements up as well. So a really important next Saturday, um, our Medicine Buddha retreats, on, you know, online retreat. Um, um, so please come out to that. And we're just gonna be practicing and studying some of the texts coming out of the Medicine Buddha tradition. And, and hopefully if I can find um, some of these teachings, some teachings from my teachers around Medicine Buddha, if I can find some of those recordings, I'll share that. Um, let's see. And of course, tomorrow starts the gathering series um, as well. For those of you who I identify as BIPOC. And of course, you can just go right to the registration um, and sign up for that. That'll be the next three Tuesdays ending with a Saturday retreat um, uh, on the 23rd as well. Um, okay, 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 okay. Um, questions can go into the question box at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, yeah, good to see you, Denise. Yeah, we had a good practice. Yesterday we had mother, the practice of the mother. Um, yesterday, um, and I'm sure you're, for those of you who, you know, we used to do mother practice pretty regularly. Um, I'm really working to get it back into the schedule to do it once a month now, but, um, you know, what we're trying to do with these practices, what I'm trying to do, and I'm just kind of like pushing you along, is to get into the essence um, of these practices, right? To, to really to go beyond um, a lot of the, I would say ritual of practice and to get into the heart of practice, just like sitting in the heart of practice. And this is, um, you know, um, like this is, what would I call it? Like if I were to use really strict Tibetan Buddhist language, then, you know, what we're doing is, I mean, you're sitting in uh, the empowerment, I would say the empowerment, the wong of, of practice. Um, and, and empowerment means, you know, the ritual uh, permission to, to approach a practice, to do a practice, right? And you get ritual permission by being introduced to the essence of the practice. And, and I just really believe that we should just always be practicing in the essence. So, you know, um, so that's what we do. <laughs> you know? um, and so we did that with the mother yesterday, just like really sitting in this, like this experience of being cared for, which I think all of us could use right now, use a lot of. Um, I want us to, you know, to become channels um, of this sacred energy, which is the conscious, energy, conscious, the intelligent energy or the consciousness of of these enlightened, awoken beings, right? Um, to sit in 
that consciousness of the mother, of Medicine Buddha, and so forth, to sit, as we would say in Tibetan Buddhism, to sit in the consciousness of the Lama, right? The Guru, to sit within the consciousness of the Guru, because the consciousness of the Guru is the same consciousness as the deity, which is the same consciousness that we share, right? And maybe what makes our experience of consciousness different is that we're not, we haven't, we haven't awoken yet. Like our, we haven't realized uh, the nature of our own consciousness. Like our awareness hasn't gazed upon itself. Um, you know, our awareness hasn't gazed, our awareness hasn't realized itself, right? Um, you know, so much of what we struggle with um, is just not being, being clear about who and what we are. And so our energy gets, um, channel distracted into other things like the ego, like the sense of self, like the sense of ego, right? And what we're trying to do is divest from this experience of ego and reinvest um, in becoming aware of the nature of things, including the nature of ego and self, and ego and self, right? Uh, we're never trying to erase anything. We're not trying to empty the mind. That's not that's not ever what I do. Um, that's not how I've been trained. But what we're trying to do is actually understand, realize, embody, oh, and an awareness and awareness that is holding everything. That is that is the essence of everything. Awareness itself, this consciousness, this intelligent energy is the essence of everything, you know? Not the sense of ego, but the experience of consciousness of intelligent energy, you know, is what we're trying to realize, right? And once you realize the nature of one thing, you realize the nature of everything um, as well. It doesn't matter what that thing is, you know, it could be a candle flame, it could be, you know, um, sound, um, a thought, right? It doesn't matter what it is because the nature of everything is everything. You know, of course, Lauren Hill taught us that in the 90s. Um, everything is everything, right? Um, so the nature of one thing is the same nature of another, or the nature of one thing is the nature of everything essentially. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, just a reminder, prayer requests can go up, questions can go down into the chat box. Um, so much happening, happening this year, many years, many centuries, <laughs> things happening. Um, yeah. And so in relationship to all of this, like, you know, what we're trying to do in terms of developing an experience of the essence of everything is really, is also once we develop, once we understand the nature of one thing, Again, we understand the nature of everything, including violence. The nature of violence is the same nature as the deity, as Medicine Buddha, right? That's very high level teaching. Um, I apologize for those of you who are just like joining for the first time. I just kind of, I know what it's like to step into a situation like this and get this language, but um, this is why I think Saturday is important. So I'll, you know, probably do some fundamental ground level stuff, right? For those of us who are new to the tradition, but yeah, the nature of everything is everything. The nature of love, right? It's the same nature as violence as well. You know? 
things are liberated, phenomenal reality. Everything in the phenomenal world is liberated when we actually begin, when we actually realize this nature. Everything gets liberated from our assumptions. Everything gets liberated from our narratives, right? Um, everything gets liberated from our like projections onto it, you know? Because in this practice, right, in Tantra, in general, we're trying to liberate everything. And what that means is that not only are we trying to liberate ourselves from ignorance, we're trying to liberate the phenomenal world from our projections upon it. Because it's our projections that continue to fuel, perpetuate uh, the realness of everything, right? If everything is super real, then there's always right, um, the, the experience of suffering, right? The realer we make everything, the more suffering we will experience, right? And for some of us, the world is super real right now. And because of that, so many of us experience a lot of suffering. I think one of the antidotes to this, so the over realness of everything and to the suffering that comes with the super realness of everything is to 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 train and and holding space for everything. I've been um, really thinking about um, been thinking about I'm actually I'm always thinking about this, you know, the like what I can do right to help all of us. Um, kind of show up to the world, right? Um, and how, and then to show up and not to show up in dread and anxiety and fear and despair, but to show up in this Mm, optimism, but I think optimism is not strong enough. I think I want I want us to show up in a deep joyfulness and appreciation. You know, and of course, I just lost everyone with that statement. <laughs> um, and you say, well, how can we possibly do this? Look at what's going on in the world. Absolutely, but we're not showing. We're not using. We're not relying on what's happening in the world, right, to to serve as a as a foundation for the joy and gratitude. The joy and the gratitude has to simply be there, like because joy and gratitude is always there. We just are not doing the work to connect to those experiences right, in our minds and also in our bodies, right. Like we were choosing to get hooked by the realness of everything, like, 
And the realness that we're perceiving is these are legit things, right? This isn't just like, oh, everything's real. Like this is this is really a struggle now, right? Against um, so much, you know, hate, right? And, and violence against ourselves, against our communities, right? Where we're struggling with a real experience of, you know, well, in this country, in America, the United States, you know, we're struggling against um, this real potential of like becoming a very fascist country. Um, and what that means, you know, you know, fascism, when, when, when we succumb to fascism, it's really, you know, this experience of, you know, people running away, distancing themselves from like their real suffering, their, their actual experience of suffering, right? And doing everything that one can to control, dominate the world, right? You know, to to control the phenomenal world in order to not have to do anything about the real experiences of suffering that all of us go through, right? Um, and so when I see all the stuff that's happening, you know, I see a lot of people who are afraid of themselves. And so therefore they're creating, they're enacting these rituals, um, actually perpetuating these rituals in the world in terms of oppression and segregation, um, banning things and so forth, right? Forcing people into a certain way of being because they don't want to be reminded of their own suffering. You know, and the easiest way to understand that is just think about all the ways in which we have manipulated and controlled and resorted to violence against others around us when we've been in pain and not wanting to do anything about that pain. Right? So we react to it, you know, trying to dominate spaces around us. When in fact, the only path of liberation is to actually turn that attention back inward, to begin to tend to and to take care of our own experiences of suffering. I just, at this point in my practice, I don't really take a lot of things personally. <laughs> you know, um, and, it's, and and of course that's a that was a imperative practice being born black and queer in this country. You know, it's like I'm not. I had to look. The Dharma helped me to depersonalize all the violence that I survived. You know, because it wasn't ever about me, right? It's like this the systematic oppression. And violence is never about me, it's about other people's insecurities. You know, it's people's deep fear, people's deep pain, and they don't know how to take care of that, right? So they try to take care of me, and I say, take care of me, trying to erase me, trying to silence me, trying to control and dominate me. Showing up in gratitude and joy um, for me is is really grounded in this real in, in this realization, right? That people aren't inherently evil, but people are full of pain, and they're not doing a great job working with that pain. That that offers a lot of space to be in the world because this idea of evil. Uh, is really quite rigid, 
and lacks any kind of change. Like when we when we label something or someone evil, then we say that's inherently who they are, what the situation is, and and I don't. I think everyone can change. I think everyone can change. Um, I have a friend who who part of their practice is trying to like convert demons to the path of liberation. I don't have time for that, but um, they seem to have gotten a little bit of success from that. You know, but I don't want to get down the road of like demons and everything tonight. Um, I, you know, going back to joy and gratitude, right? And, you know, I, yeah, realizing that people are trying their best to work with their own situations of pain is really important, but also is understanding that this isn't my home. Like, this is just an experience I'm having. The phenomenal world is life, the relative. It's just this experience we're passing through, an important experience that we're passing through, um, a meaningful experience, but this isn't where we belong. Um, like this isn't my true home. As Thich Nhat Hanh would say, this is not my true home, um, nor is this my true face. Even though I really like this face, it is not my true face. It doesn't mean that we stop caring. It actually means that we care more but that caring actually is held by a lot of spaciousness as well, you know? And in that spaciousness, we begin to experience how everything is being held together, both the joy and the despair can arise together. Um, that the despair, you know, is an expression it is the same, has the same essence as joy. Right? There's a lot of layers, there's a lot of layers that we have to kind of move through and cut through to get to the essence of the things that we find really hard to deal with, like violence and hate, our fear, sadness, despair, and so forth. Like it takes work, the work of learning how to hold. And by holding, again, I mean how to not react, right? But to feel, to experience, right? The experiencing of things supports non-reactivity, right? And that non-reactivity through experiencing leads us into this potential for responsiveness, right? Like you get clear, the non-reactivity gets, helps us to get clear about what's actually happening, right? Because we're able to hold everything, like we can experience the fear and the despair but we don't have to react to it, right? And that's something that like we, that, that takes years for most of us, years to, to experience that. And it took me years. You know, when my mentors and elders and teachers were telling me the same thing, I would think, oh, that's so impossible. How can you possibly just hold space for everything? You know, um, especially anger, like how can you possibly hold that without reacting, right? Of course, you, you can't ever know until you actually practice. And not just once, not just twice, not just 10 times, not just 50 times, not just 100 times, not just 1,000 times, but just over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Like you lose count always every second is an opportunity 
to recognize a thought or an emotion and to, to just hold that emotion and thought and to allow yourself to experience that, you know, to, to an extent that is appropriate, of course, right? Because we all have different experiences of trauma. So we have to go at different speeds here, you know? And once you begin to hold things, you begin to develop uh, a clarity and insight uh, into everything. This, you know, this is insight meditation, I think, you know, of, of Vipassana. When you get into the space of holding, then you're able to, to gaze into things, experience things that you weren't experiencing because you were always reacting to everything. Things become clear. You begin to notice the nuances, the subtleties, right? That you're able to move through the world, not be distracted by the world, right? Of course, when, when we're not distracted, that, you know, we've, when we're not distracted, we have achieved really the first level of meditation in the Buddhist tradition, which is calm abiding or shamatha, or shane, or sometimes we can call it mindfulness as well. But that's the first level is being able to watch and not respond or to react, not to react. And then insight, vipassana, which is the second stage here, is the choice that we make to gaze deeper or move deeper into the nature of the mind itself. You know, one of the things that happens, so I've read in a book, and I also watch a docu documentary about this. Um, one of the things that happens is the one taste experience. And this is, you know, coming out to Tibetan Buddhism, one taste, right, sameness. Um, and we develop one taste, um, which is the recognition that everything is everything. You know, that this thing that I hate and this thing that I love are actually the same thing. You know, they're arising out of the same essence, which is emptiness and space and energy. But we keep forgetting that. You know, we keep forgetting that. And this is a teaching that you come back to over and over and over again, right? And also to remind you again, you know, that we're not trying to erase anything. We're not trying to get rid of anything. We're trying to hold everything, right? Like you're, there's still going to be suffering. It will be suffering until we achieve complete enlightenment. But as we move through these stages of um, realization, right? It's not that like things disappear, but our relationship to everything changes. Right? The relationship changes. And when my relationship to something changes, then the thing itself actually changes as well, because the thing that I've been in a particular relationship with is being shaped by my relationship with it. You know? We're creating like the expression of something through relationships that we have with the thing itself. When I say liberate phenomenal reality, we're trying to, again to liberate the phenomenal world from our perceptions, from our assumptions. Right. 
I think moving into the heart of the deity, you know, in tantric practice uh, is one of those really skillful ways that this happens um, in tantric traditions, not just through meditation, but through deity practice, which is an expression of meditation, right? When we do deity practices like Medicine Buddha, we're actually moving through all these stages of practice, which is why I think Tantra is such, is so skillful. Um, you think you're just kind of sitting, imagining, having fun, tripping out. You're actually practicing these fundamental um, practices around meditation. Um, you're still training the mind. Right. And in tantric practice, right, we're training the mind and our awareness to start identifying with the expression of the wisdom itself. You know, so Medicine Buddha is a wisdom deity, which means that Medicine Buddha arises out of the nature of things, but also a worldly deity who still has some ego, right? Um, wants and needs. But Medicine Buddha doesn't want and need anything. Right? Of course, there are worldly deities, again, that accompany all the wisdom deities as well. Those wisdom deities need things. I'm sorry, those worldly deities uh, need things because they're still tied to some expression of ego, right? So they require a kind of, there's their beings still somewhat tied to the relative. And one of the laws of the relative world is balance, right? So we're all subjected by that rule and the relative, which is you know, balance. Things have to you know, stay balanced. The really interesting about apocalypse, uh, which is what we're going through right now, like there's, there's no need to, to continue to resist this reality, this is an apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, the apocalypse is about rebalancing, you know, it's about bringing the phenomenal world, well, it's society, culture, back into balance, right? But of course, society and culture have a direct impact on all phenomena, right? So we're coming back into balance, which also means that we have to move through like the grief and trauma of everything, right? Actually, what it means is that we're having to, to come back home to ourselves in order to reestablish balance, right? So of course, one of the things about this balancing is that what is taken, right? Like what is taken has to be restored. You know, what goes up must come down. I mean, basics, you know. So, you know, for those of us who are initiated into the practices of worldly deities, um, no, you know, particularly, um, you know, all, you know, all kinds of traditions of worldly deities, but, but you know that what is off, what is taken from the deity, what is freely offered from the deity to us must also be freely offered back. Maybe not the same thing, but we offer something back to the deity to maintain the balance. And I started, I started really trying to understand this when I started getting um, involved, you know, with the, you know, with the, all these teachers and everything in my twenties and, you know, just, Getting you know involved in like you know healing with healers and 
um, magic practitioners, priestess, you know, when I started, you know, getting involved and stuff and how there was such an emphasis on balance because magic, of course, is about balance as well as a relative expression, right? Um, but there was always something old, right? And I would get so frustrated with that, you know? Now I would get frustrated and I would kind of, I came into Buddhism and I was frustrated with that. Like everything cost, everything had to, you know, I was just, I was like, why can't I just take everything? Why can't things just be freely offered? You know, and of course over the years I learned like, oh, because like there's balance that has to be maintained, right? And I began to see the importance of balancing in all these different experiences and all these different relationships. Like with my teachers, right? It's like they've given me something really important and I want them to continue to do that for myself and others. And therefore I offer something back, be it money or food or service or some something. You know, I offer something back so they can continue to do the work. Of helping others and continue to do the work of helping me. Yeah. It's I, I would say it's hard to work and to give when people you're supporting aren't offering back something. Um, but this is again one of the basic laws, right? Is that like I have to continually, I have to, con I have to keep understanding that I have to keep staying in service and offering to maintain this balance, right? Um, and this balance isn't about good or bad. Again, it's about what's conducive to the balancing of everything. You know, and again, the world is out of balance, right? And I think systems like capitalism, um, for instance, really has perpetuated imbalance, right? Inequality. Um, now we're having to come back into balance by any means necessary, really. Just the natural world will find balance again with or without us. You know, the natural world, the phenomenon, well, the natural world, I'm gonna say the natural world, the environment, the climate will come back into balance. You know, like we can be a part of that coming back into the balance or we can be people in the way you know, of that balancing, therefore we will be removed because that's really how nature works. Right? Balance is the law. Right? Um, Let's move into our practice now. I'm already practicing, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> but I, I keep being pulled into this, like this stillness, right? And stillness is also at the heart of everything, the stillness, right? Not silence, right? but stillness, the settledness. Even as things are chaotic or hectic or moving, there's still stillness at the heart of that movement. 
right? Because you get to the stillness by learning how to tune into the, the essence of, of, of the phenomenal world of everything. Right? That essence is stillness. that everything else is an illusion. When we say stillness, there are things that are permanent, you know? And the relative, right, in the relative world, yes, there's impermanence, but in the ultimate reality is, you know, there are things that are permanent. There are things that exist and haven't been born, you know? the nature of the mind, right? Which again, is the nature of the deity, which is the nature of all phenomena. Like it's the same nature, the same essence, right? That's, that's permanent, that's forever. Whatever that is, right? Which is, and whatever that is, is an experience. So again, always being our practice. By actually this time, just shifting our attention to the seat, okay? Beginning to notice the weight of the body, making contact with the seat. Using that sensation of the body meeting the seat as an anchor, this is anchoring our attention. And so even here, I wonder if we can experience the care from the seat. Really meaning that like how the seat is holding us is an expression of care. I wonder if we can just tune into that, acknowledge that, that my seat is caring for me. And I wonder if you can Surrender to the seat. Just let the seat hold you. Let the seat do this one job. Right? And one of the things that you'll notice in your practice, right, particularly for those of you who um, do a lot of somatic practice, is that you will begin to notice how we hold things uh, in the body, like we hold, like we energetically hold labor in our bodies. Like we feel like for those of us who are just supporting a bunch of people who, you know, where people are just relying on us, we start holding this experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like we're absorbing people's weights. Um, the, we absorb people's burdens, I would say, right, energetically. And we posit those energetic burdens in the body and they arise as certain um, sensations, physical sensations, right? I think it's important 
you know, for us to kind of figure out where we're holding people's stuff, right? And this particular practice of allowing the seed to hold you and surrendering to the seed is a really, really powerful way to let go of the things that we're energetically holding for others. And we need to let it go, right? This is not just, oh, it would be nice if we did this. This is imperative because these these experiences aren't ours to hold on to. We may absorb them, but we have to let them go at some point. So the seat is a wonderful way, right, to let go of what we're holding on to. You know, in my practice, I like to just kind of look at, scan to the body and try to, to notice what feels really heavy and tight, right? If you're working with the breath, the breath can be a tool that we use here, like inhaling deeply into the body. And then imagining that the in-breath begins to dissolve. You know, whatever feels heavy. And then releasing that energy down to the body and to the earth. Well, the earth will naturally just neutralize its energy. But inhaling, imagine that whatever burden, burden is being dissolved, and then exhaling down through the body into the You can even breathe, inhale into an experience of your body right, that feels heavy and allowing that breath to dissolve that energy and release it. And this is something that I think we should do, you know, if this is something that's appropriate for you, this is something you should do and can do as much as you want. Definitely before you rest or go to sleep or something. Just release it. I think it can. If you keep doing this, right, you'll begin to experience some energetic shifts as well because you're opening up space, like energy is being redirected. Right? So a few more moments here. So when you're ready, you can shift your attention even lower through the body, through the seat, down into the earth, the land under you. And it's our attention, which is again, conscious, aware energy, or rather intelligent energy, is acknowledging, touching into 
the, the conscious, <clears throat> the intelligent energy of the earth, the consciousness of the earth itself, which we call the mother, right? the earth as the mother. And our consciousness touches the consciousness of the earth, the land. And that touching deepens a kind of um, connection to the earth. And so, many, so much of what we struggle with collectively is a disconnection from the earth. So this is a practice that invites us to, to reconnect to the consciousness of the earth, of the land. How does the land feel, right? How does the land feel? What is your experience of the land under you? And just to say that the land is experiencing more than trauma and sadness and despair. Again, you know, some of the work that we're trying to do is to disrupt the ways in which we're projecting our suffering on to other beings. Right? And not to say there isn't these energies in the earth expressing themselves in the earth, but that's not the only thing that's happening. And I wonder if we can touch deeper through the grief and sadness into the joy the land, the richness of the land, to the gratitude of the land. And touching into those energies, gratitude and joy and so forth, it's like tapping into like an underground spring or a well or something, like the fresh water, the clarity of the water, the nutrient, mineral, density of that water deep in the earth, like touching into that and feeling, allowing that restorative energy to really just like fill our experience up. Right? And this is what, just by chance, some of you may be water diviners. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly a water diviner, but um, this is part of the work of water divining. It's like connecting to this, to the to the consciousness of the water element, actually, within the consciousness of the earth, the richness. Right, the restorative energy. Right, and of course, the water is also drawing nutrients from the earth, the earth is drawing nutrients from water, and so forth. That there's a relationship there, you know. But when we this kind of sacred water divining, we do our consciousness touching into the earth to touch in to touch the essence of water of the clearest, most powerful nutrient and mineral dense water. These living waters actually, we call super mineral dense, naturally minerally dense water, living water. So can you, what can you feel?
And if you touch into some of this energy of sacred water, right in the land under us, we can actually begin to really consciously draw that essence into our bodies and minds. And you can use the earth here as well if you're not connecting to the water element here. But just like we would do an earth breath, an earth breathing, like I begin to imagine that I'm inhaling up into my, actually my root chakra, which is our tailbones, area in our tailbones. Like we're inhaling from the source of sacred water or from the consciousness of sacred earth, inhaling the essence of that liberatory restorative energy into the root chakra, which is a tailbone area in our bodies. And just, and just practicing with that for a couple of moments, right? Just inhaling from the earth, from the living waters in the earth, that restorative energy, inhaling it into the root chakra, the tailbone. I mean, just imagine that the, the root chakra, which is energetically about home and stability and groundedness, is actually beginning to be filled with this energy and beginning to feel more stabilized, more grounded, more connected. So inhaling from earth, inhaling from water into the tailbone, the root chakra. And we can imagine that the root chakra, the tailbone just becomes awakened, it becomes activated. So inhaling into the root chakra. And we'll come back to the exhale. And if you're not working with the breath, just imagine that the this, this energy, the sacred energy from the earth or from water in the earth is really just radiating up into the base of your spine. A couple more breaths if you're working with the breath. All right. Let's go a little further with the breath. So as we inhale up into the tailbone, the root chakra, we take a full deep breath. Inhale into the root chakra and then hold the breath at the root chakra just for a couple of seconds or as long as you want, actually, if you're experienced with this kind of pranayama. We're holding the breath there, which means that we're intensifying uh, the energy at the base of the spine, the root chakra. And as we prepare to exhale, we're imagining that we're gonna exhale that intensified energy from the root chakra up into the heart chakra, which is the upper middle chest. So inhaling into the root chakra, holding. Exhale. 
and then releasing up into the heart chakra where this energy collects in the heart chakra. And so we're beginning to also activate the heart chakra. And this is intentional. I'm skipping the other two chakras here, <laughs> you know, the second and third chakra to go straight up into the heart chakra because we're trying to activate stability and we're trying to activate and awaken the heart, which is how we get deeper into compassion which is one of many things that we practice with in the heart chakra, a compassion, deep empathy, right, and openness. Right, the realization that everyone is suffering, not just me, not just the people that I love, everyone, including the people who hurt me, are also suffering. And we're activating the root chakra first to actually to cultivate the sense of safety. Right? So safety, home, groundedness, stability. Or just, just a few of the qualities and experiences we're awakening with the root chakra. So if you're not working with the breath, just imagine of course, this energy from the earth and from the water in the earth absorbing into the root chakra, the base of the spine. And then slowly moving up into the heart chakra. And if you don't, if you're using the breath and kind of get tired of holding the breath, you can just do a straight kind of inhaling from the earth into the root chakra and then exhaling directly up into the heart chakra. I'm just noticing awakening and whatever form it's taking, right? And so awakening can feel like openness, expansion. It can also be really uncomfortable as well. Because we're, in a way, beginning to melt or chip away at the crustiness around the heart chakra. That's what happens when we're you know, when most of us are choosing to stay closed down or right, to stay, you know, tight. And so when we come and we do practices like this to begin to open, that chakra is going to be uncomfortable. It may be painful. We may feel a little ungrounded. We may feel a little lightheaded as well. And if any of those experiences become too overwhelming, just coming back to the seat, the weight of the body, some simple movement, a drink of water, taking a break, you know, these kinds of things that kind of help to regulate us. Right? And slowly, the heart chakra begins to awaken, right? And it begins to radiate light into the rest of the body. And of course, traditionally, we understand the heart chakra to be green, you know, which is the color of activity, uh, efficiency, um, practice of doing, um, the practice, the, the color of summer is green, right? So this, we can imagine a green light beginning to radiate through the body as a sign that the heart chakra is slowly beginning to awaken. If you want to add 
Another little piece on top of this too, you can also begin to imagine the awakening of the root chakra, the base of the spine, which the root chakra is red. So maybe there's a red light that begins to radiate from the root of the spine up into the body, along with the screen radiating from the heart chakra. So there's lots happening right now. And just, just choose wherever feels appropriate for you to stay with and the practice with. And let's move into our mantras now. We're going, to, we're going to begin with our first mantra, which is just an invitation that begins to awaken or to invite and awaken the consciousness of Medicine Buddha you know, in our bodies and minds and in the space around us. And you can sit and listen, or you can chant, whichever you know is appropriate for you. All right. So, Um Menla, Um Menla Sanye Kino Soha. We'll start with Um, and then we'll go just chanting just for a few times. <clears throat> oh. Om. Oh. Sange ki no so um la sange ki no so um la sange. So for the first part of our main mantra, which we'll get to in just a second, this is just where we're just gonna be. It is gonna be continually to continuing to uh, to uh, like breathe this inhale inhale this energy from the earth uh, up into the body. It's energy of of the water now. So the energy of the earth may come to us as being energy, stabilizing energy, grounded energy, the energy of sacred water, right? Is the energy of fluidity, of movement. Um, so you may feel a lot of openness, like when you're practicing with sacred water energy. Um, you may feel energy moving down right through the body into the earth, and that's fine. Um, if you have any kind of sacred stones, like if you practice stone medicine, which is working with you know, sacred crystals and rocks and, and so forth, um, a dark, uh, heavy stone, um, is always really good um, to work with in terms of grounding, feeling more stabilized, so you can work with that. Um, working with clearer stones, um, clearer rocks and crystals and so forth actually help to, to open up the flow of things. So just, you know, just being, you know, making your own choices here if you do do practice with stone medicine. Um, but 
But again, the stabilizing of the earth, the fluidity and movement of sacred water, maybe filling those together in your, your practice. And just notice what that feels like, really. You know, this is a, a great, great area of exploration and experimentation, <laughs> right? Welcome to Tantra. You know, you just do shit and see what happens. Right? But as we go into our main mantra, Teya Taun, Bacon Zay, Bacon Zay, Maha Bacon Zay, Rasa Sumo Gate, Sohar, just sitting in this energy. Be it the movement of energy from water, be it the stabilization of energy through the earth, or be it, be it a combination of both. My, um, I would say kosha, my body type, and Ayurveda is kapha, and so I'm the combination of water uh, and earth, uh, which may make mud, but, so I can, this is like a very natural, energetic place for me to practice at the union of water and earth. Um, but noticing, again, the awakening, right, of the heart chakra, the awakening of the root chakra, on top of that, as you're continuing to work with this energy. And just sitting and holding it. And this is, this is, this draws us into the consciousness, the essence of Medicine Buddha, of Min La Sangi. We'll begin. Om La Om te a da um be gen ze be gen ze ma be gen ze la ze su um da te so a te a da um be gen ze be gen ze ma be gen ze la ze su um da te so a te a da um be gen ze be Big and 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 big
As always, we begin <clears throat> by just calling into our space all the beings um, who can help us um, with the fruition right, of our prayers. All the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Dharma protectors, <clears throat> all the saints, all the elements, all benevolent beings, all benevolent ancestors. All deities, we ask that you hear the prayers that we offer, that you hear the prayers that are unarticulated, that have not been offered, and we pray that you move to bring about the fruition of all the prayers that we offer. We're offering prayers for my recovery from COVID. And my friends, for all those with COVID, to all of us with the disrupted attachment from Mother Earth, offering a prayer for balance in my own body. Offering prayers that may, um, for my ability to skillfully grieve and integrate after the medical system almost killed me in the past several months. I pray to stay with the awakening brought by the reality of my death. 
I pray to recover my agency after having it taken away from me. I pray to cultivate the deep wellspring of love in myself. We're offering prayers for those held by grief and anxiety. We're offering prayers for my knee and nerves and my feet to heal after surgery. That I might remain calm and hopeful rather than fearful. fearful. Prayers for Lamara in our homecoming circles. Offering prayers to that all beings may access love, healing, and freedom. Prayers that, are, that our imaginations may expand and transform so all beings can access love and liberation. Offering prayers and blessings for my practice and my spiritual path, my work, and for the discipline and hard work for realizing my career goals and for living the Dharma through all situations and circumstances. Offering prayers, protection, and gratitude for Lama Rod and all involved with Lumi Sparsha, prayers for free Tibet, prayers for Bhumi Ma, for the end of suffering and freedom for all beings and all realms. We're offering prayers for my own recovery from surgery to those affected by the US empire past, present and future for those who are in need of compassion. We're offering prayers for Hava Bailey struggling with long-term effects of serious head injury several years ago. We're offering prayers for my sister's son, my nephew, Malik, who is struggling with living through his recent and long-term incarceration and personal anguish around his experiences in this lifetime. Prayers for my sister, Shana, as she grapples with the enormity of his pain and grief and tries to both hold and release his spirit as it journeys. We're offering prayers for all who hate and for the hated. Prayers for all obsessed with unending greed and value it above the lives and well-being of others. Prayers for everyone I am unable to hold in my journey. Prayers for all the folks who have held, the, held me along my journey. Prayers for uh, uh, Tichamako and the healing finds him before the inevitability of death. Prayers for my mother and sister as they find love for themselves, as they mirror one another. We're offering prayers for my father who was undergoing a procedure on his heart this week. Prayers that he experiences as little pain and suffering as possible, that the operation is successful, and that it brings him health and happiness. I'm offering prayers for Rihanna, Jen, me, and everyone with the uterus. We're offering prayers for my mom. May she find peace and feel connected as she contends with multiple illnesses and physical pain. Prayers for me, may I experience peace, presence, love, and connection. While well, free prayers for my son-in-law, Andy, with COVID, my daughter, Hollister, and their children, Graham and Catherine, who are all now having symptoms. Prayers for Tom Crana, Trisha Dalish, and Eve Isson, all dealing with different forms of cancer. We're offering prayers for Aunt Layla in the ICU. Prayers for Sam and everyone dealing with COVID. Prayers for Sarah and all abortion clinic workers. We're offering prayers for the family who, we're offering prayers for the family who do not know how to love us. Prayers for the family humans that do. We're offering prayers for Isabel, who will be undergoing surgery for removal of a cankerous growth next Monday. Becca, who has a teenager who recently came out as trans and wisdom and how to be skillful in relating to her child. Father Franklin and his continued hospital chaplaincy and, ter and Terry for strength and kindness 
as she supports her mom who is dying right now. Offering prayers for Kat and her mom who is entering the bardo. Prayers for Terry who has COVID for the second time in the month. Prayers for my family and the AME church as they work to maintain a historically black church against all the forces arrayed against us. Prayers for everyone, prayers for myself and my husband as we slowly recover from COVID. Prayers for my father, please who joined the ancestors on Friday afternoon. And offering prayers for my ancestors and my relationship with them when I code differently than them. Prayers for my granny as she turns 99 years old today. Prayers for me as I navigate a very difficult relationship with my mother after the passing of my father. I'm gonna offer all the prayers again, that remain unspoken, the prayers that we don't even know how to articulate. I continue to offer prayers for balance in this world, for the alleviation of all systems of violence, of harm, all systems of hate and erasure. I wanna especially offer prayers for those who are passing into the bardo and the spirit world right now. We offer the energy of our practice to lighting their way, guiding their way into this next further expression of themselves. We pray for the planet as well, for our climate. We pray for help, always, from all those who have gathered to listen to these prayers, to hold these prayers, and to work on our behalf to bring about these prayers. We ask for help and support, for guidance, love, tending to. We, we ask for care for ourselves and for our communities. And I pray for all of those who are in this space tonight, those who us who have gathered to practice the profound path of Medicine Buddha, that we all continue to be blessed by this profound practice. And may we all, regardless of who we are or what we've done, may we all get free as quickly as possible. So as we go back into just a, a couple of minutes of the of this main mantra, I just encourage you just to continue to sit with deeply embodying this energy of water and earth. And maybe we can begin to imagine if this is if this is something that's appropriate for you right now, that you begin to share the healing energies of earth and water with those who we've offered prayers for. Just imagine that this energy is radiating from our bodies, from our minds, into the world, into the lives and situations of all those who need these energies right now. 
knowing that these energies are an expression of the consciousness of Medicine Buddha. We begin again. And so, just shifting our attention back to the seat. Again, noticing the weight of our bodies, making contact with the seat. We're gonna rise up again and just do just a very short few rounds of the, the protection, the, both the protection and healing mantra of Mother, Mother Durga. Durga Ma. Om Dum Durga Ye Namaha. Again, as we chant, Mother Durga, just imagining protection. Protection for ourselves, protection for those that we've been praying for, protection for our communities, protection for the land. Trusting that everything that we offer prayers for, everyone we offer prayers for, and our prayer in our praying and in our chanting is protected and guided and held and tended to.
And again, again, we'll begin with Om. And we go into the mother's mantra. So again, shifting our attention to the seat, allowing the seat to rise, to hold us and to care for us. I thank the earth and the sacred water for supporting our practice today. We thank the seats, we thank the body, we thank our minds, we thank all the deities, all the spirits, saints, ancestors for supporting our practice. And whenever you are ready, just offering some simple movement, awakening the body. <clears throat> And we're going to now just finish up with chanting Shanti Devas or reciting Shanti Devas prayer uh, from the Bodhisattva's way of life. And we'll begin. May I be a protector to those without protection, a leader for those who journey 
and a boat, a bridge, a passage for those desiring the further shore. May the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be the doctor and the medicine, and may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. Just like space and the great elements such as Earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. And until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach unto the ends of space. May I be a protector to those without protection, a leader for those who journey, and a boat, a bridge, a passage for those desiring the further shore. May the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be the doctor and the medicine. And may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. Just like space and the great elements such as Earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. And until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach into the ends of space. And finally, may I be a protector to those without protection, a leader for those who journey, and a boat, a bridge, a passage for those desiring the further shore. May the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be the doctor and the medicine. And may I, may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. Just like space and the great elements such as Earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. And until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach into the ends of space. Right, everyone. Um, I um, I'm just gonna just try to get answer these two questions here. I know we're always past time, um, so if you stay on, that'll be fine. Of course, this is recorded, um, so you can look at the recording later. Um, uh, question, first question, um. So since Roe versus Wade was struck down, I've been in a, a free state, right? Um, it was a trauma, like it's a trauma response. Every everything feels very, very heavy, and it's taking so much energy to keep going as I try to process this amid ongoing mass shootings and the general end of the world. Okay. You have suggestions on how to keep going, to not give in to depression, not to have um, not to have old body related trauma triggering constantly. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, one. So this is this is something that I've been meaning to say as well. There's so many people right now. You know, in the media, on social media, maybe people in our lives who are just like, they're just like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. Everything's crumbling. Everything's like, this is the end, right? And I'm really getting tired of all of this, actually. So there are so many people, the people, the people who are speaking the loudest, some of the people who have the largest platforms, are people who actually don't know how to struggle, uh, who don't come from cultures of struggle, um, who um, don't actually know how to push through um, situations that seem impossible. Um, and I'm just getting, I'm, I'm, and this is affecting all of us. It really is. And I'm just getting just really annoyed <laughs> by all of this, you know, because no one in my communities are talking about giving up. Shit, you know, <laughs> like I, I was, you know, I come, I come from a community of struggle, 
Like every time shit happens, like I just have to call my mom. My mom was like, listen, we're just gonna work. You know, my mom's an organizer, my mom's a spiritual leader. She's like, we just work. You know, we struggle, we work. We get through this, we rely on our practice, we rely on, you know, our beliefs, but we get through this, right? And a practice that I have for all of you, including yourself, Holly, is to remember ancestors who who really, people who were alive in times that seemed hopeless and the work that they did to make sure that we were born into a situation that was a little better, you know, than what they were born into. Remember that strength and courage because those those energies, those those consciousness, conscious, what's the plural of consciousness? Consciousnesses <laughs> are still present. They're still they're still here, and just remember, you know, um, who like remember who like remember. I mean, no one's asked this. I'm just answering in my head, asking in my head, but like. I just, I have an endless supply, endless line of people that I remember and call on, you know. You know, for me recently, it's been Harriet Tubman, you know. Um, it's been also recently Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, it's been, you know, like it, it always changes, you know, because this is my main, one of my main practices is remembering the people who fought, who never gave up, who are the reason we're here now. Like nothing, nothing is lost. You know, nothing is lost. And that's that's one of the things, this becomes a mantra for us. Nothing is lost, you know. But it means that we have to we have to work harder, we have to organize differently, we have to we have to get together with people and start dreaming a different way of being. Um, you start you start acting up, you know. Um, I don't under I don't understand people who follow laws. <laughs> you know, once again I'm black and queer. So like this is just like, you know, very weird for me, you know. Um, coming from a community where 50 years ago, like it was illegal to be black. It still is illegal to be black. But yeah, yeah. So this is the main practice to remember, remember someone, invoke someone who struggled before us, who came before us and to call on their strength the call on your consciousness. Like, this is really important. Like, this is very tantric, you know. This is like guru yoga. Like, guru yoga is like opening our minds to the real, the realization of the teacher, of the lama, right, of the guru. We do the same thing with those who've come before us, right? Um, yeah. And then this last question, we have more questions. Um, so how do we distinguish between withdrawing our projections of realness and numbing, shutting out our connections to the phenomenal? Well, you still feel everything. Like numbness is the lack of feeling, like you still feel it. Like the thing is always, we're holding space for everything. We're not bypassing it. We're not erasing. We're holding space and not reacting, right? If there's nothing to react to, then that's probably bypassing and shutting down. Um, and I guess you can still hear me. I don't know where I went to on the screen, but um, okay, there we go. But um, yeah, when you're when when you're not experiencing anything, you're numbing and bypassing, right? Um, like everything is real, relatively real, right? In the relative level, this is real, and I can just feel it, but I don't get lost in it. 
I don't feel overwhelmed by the I don't feel overwhelmed by the world. Now, granted, I do feel overwhelmed by the practices that I'm doing sometimes to support the world. Do you hear the rain? Do you hear the thunder? It's a really good sign, actually. Um, and let me get to this last question. I will get the question. Let's see. I'm just talking out loud. So when I get stressed, I notice addictive, addictive energies resurface. Any time for practices to help cut through addictions. Well, you know, you know, on a really like basic general level, when we start thinking about addictions, I used to actually work in recovery um, before I, I moved to the monastery. Um, so this, like this, like area is something that I feel really passionate about. But Yeah, you know, addiction from a Buddhist psychology, tantric perspective is, you know, it's, it's just a way that we're bypassing, avoiding um, the hurts. You know, what is the real hurt that we feel as if we don't have the capacity to tend to, right? And so, as I've often, you know, talked about in this space, for me, um, I call on uh, my circle of care, like I'm my benefactors, like we, um, like we did, like when we were offering prayers, like calling all your benefactors, all the people who love you. And I ask for help. I ask them to support me as I hold space for the things that I just really kind of want to run, run away from, or the things that I really just kind of want to cover over by doing something else. You know, there's a skillful way. I call it. I don't know if this is the right. It's called the pendulum. I think it's this is the right term. Pendulum, where you go in and out, right? Yeah, I think this is right. You go in and out of relationship with um, an experience of discomfort. And so what I what I mean by that is that like you can skillfully choose to avoid something. Like if there's something that's too much to deal with, like when we do, when we do our trauma work, you know, um, you know, it's like trauma work isn't about always just like diving into the trauma. It's about creating conditions where we have agency to choose how to, to be in a relationship to our trauma, right? And so sometimes it means that like I am intentionally not dealing with this with something painful. Now, this is the key word here, intentionally. Like, I am making a choice to do something else, to change the channel for a period, which allows me to feel some sense of restoration so I can come back later on and work with the energy, the uncomfortable energy. Um, that's a hard practice, but not impossible. And I think the more advancement, so the more we practice, the easier that becomes. I'm saying it becomes easier when we're not bullshitting ourselves, right? This is and that. This is the fine line. Like we can easily bullshit ourselves and say like, oh, I'm not gonna deal with this. I'm gonna just. I'm just gonna go watch Netflix, right? I'm gonna, you know, do whatever. I'm gonna hop on social media and distract myself, right? It's a fine line because you can get stuck in that avoidance, you know. But what I do, what I've trained to do with the help of teachers and community is that, like, you know, of course, I first learned this from my teacher who said this very directly, you know. Um, he was like, sometimes you have to change the channel when it gets intense because you don't have what you need in the moment to really lean into this. So go somewhere else, have fun rest, restore, and once you feel resource, then you come back in your hand and working with the discomfort, you know, through the practices, right, um, as well. Um, so, and the, and the question here is cutting through addictions, right, you know, the, in, in the tantric sense, right, we cut through, well, the ultimate practice is just realizing the nature of an addiction as being um, the expression of emptiness and space and energy, right, that's the ultimate practice. 
But the relevant practice here, you know, is really just asking ourselves, okay, what am I avoiding, right? And what do I need help in doing to, in terms of being in a relationship with the discomfort of the moment? Like, what kind of help do I need to call into my practice, into my experience um, as well? And that's, that's, the, that's a strict tantric kind of advice that I would give, right? You know, ask for help. You know, when I feel myself um, avoiding in a way that doesn't feel as if I have agency, it feels like a reaction, then I ask, I acknowledge it and say, okay, this is what I see myself doing and I want to ask for help for my benefactors, for my circle to, to, to support me right now, right? And to help me experience what I can of the discomfort that I'm seeking to avoid. And then over time, the more you're in a relationship to discomfort, the more that experience transforms into something else, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to leave it at there. So, again, Saturday, right, you can come and ask questions, and um, and we're just going to be practicing. I'm going to be working um, just through just some traditional commentaries um, around Medicine Buddha and so forth, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, okay? So, thank you, everyone. Please... Take care of yourself, and maybe I'll see some of you tomorrow for our first gathering, okay? All right, thank you, everyone. Please be well. Please remember to practice as well.